I'm so glad you're with us on the Clark Howard Show, where the goal is about you empowering yourself with knowledge so you can save more, spend less, and not let anyone ever rip you off. On the web, we're at Clark.com, C-L-A-R-K.com. You got a question for me? Clark.com slash ask. Coming up in just 20 minutes. Yet more proof why you need to hide from full commission stock brokerages. They are dangerous to your wallet. And coming up a half hour from now, big, big issue in this fall campaign. Both major party political candidates running away from trade. I want to give you some perspective on where trade fits in the economy. And if it really is a big part of job losses in the United States, The reality, the numbers, may surprise you. Speaking of numbers, you want to be a millionaire? So many different ways that people crunch how someone becomes a millionaire, and most people who become millionaires do it from their own business or working in a modest profession but they are people who are savers. The financial writer Liz Weston said there are certain patterns that are clear how people become millionaires. And when you think about us as humans, you hear the first two criteria, and gosh, not a lot of people are going to make the cut on the first two criteria. One is that you buy a house, and it's the house you stay in your entire working life. Krista, you and I have talked about this with the house that you and your husband first bought not too long after you got married, that if you had kept that house and stayed there... (laughs) that you would have long ago owned your house free and clear. Yep. And you have no regrets about having moved five times. <laughs> well, I did. I moved a few times, but one of them was, you know, unintentional <laughs> when our but house you've flooded. you moved five, right? Uh, no, we've moved one, two, three times. Um, we rented oh, in between. Oh, you're on your fourth house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fourth house. Sorry. Because it was a rental in between. Yeah. So four. So... You're you're out of luck apparently, according to I this. guess so. And the I'm other an expert thing, mover though. But the other thing you're set for. You know the other part of this? Yeah, yeah. What? One spouse. Oh yes, that's true. Yeah. So when someone gets divorced, and divorce happens for any of a number of reasons, but divorce leads to an average drop in wealth. This is a stunning number. Of 77%. The economic dislocations of divorce are so strong that it has a measured, very large effect on your ability to develop significant wealth. The house thing, the house, you probably heard me talk about what I call the 10 in, 10 out rule. That when you buy a house, all the costs associated with it end up adding up to somewhere near 10% of the cost of the home. And when you sell, you end up with costs that approximate 10%. Buying and selling real estate is very expensive. So that's why staying put in a house is so important. Something that has been clear with people under 35 is they don't look at buying a home as a starter home that they'll then move on from, the mentality, and and nobody's a monolith, no group is a monolith, but there's a general trend that people under 35 now look at the house they buy as one they can be in for a long time or a lifetime. And that's sound, fundamental economics to do so. But those two things are so very, very important in improving the odds that you will become a millionaire. You can overcome those two things, but those two are the jumping off point. One spouse, one house. That even rhymes, doesn't it? 
The next thing with investing, you can't just go into savings accounts or CDs. You have to invest and invest at low cost. And so that means, although she didn't say it, in order to have money to invest, you have to live on less than what you make. But the key is, and this has been proven out again and again by study after study, ending up financially okay is not a product of what you make. It's always a product. Once you get past enough income to cover just the most basics in life, the difference in being financially secure or not is based on what you don't spend Living on less than what you make is core and key. Darren is with us on the Clark Howard Show. Darren, you have a daughter who is going to be working in Turkey. Is that true? Well, yeah. Let me first thank you, Clark, for for everything you do. I have been listening to you for a long time, and, and I've gotten so many friends and family involved, and my daughter's involved in listening to you, and you've really helped us out tremendously over the years. So thank you so much for your service you provide. Well, you're very kind to say that. Thank you very much. Yes, and uh, I reached out to you. You were the first person I thought of when I got a phone call from my daughter, and uh, she told us she was going to be getting stationed in uh, Enterlick, Turkey. Oh, she's uh, military? Yes. Oh, well, will you thank her in turn for me for her service to our great nation? Absolutely. So she's going to be at the big base that we um, that we use for flight missions and stuff, and uh, in cooperation with the Turkish military. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. All right. How can I be of service? Um, just uh, looking out there and just seeing a lot of different um, information. So I immediately thought of calling you, and and I'm trying to look at what is going to be our best. And, and uh, not necessarily affordable, because I don't know if I can tie in affordability with it, but the most reliable way to communicate with her, uh, either through cell phone or through computer. It'll be extremely easy. Great. It will be shockingly easy. In Turkey, uh, she can buy, uh, so it was a SIM card, she can pop into a cell phone there, and she will be able to talk to you as much as you want for free, and you will be able to with her as well. Oh, that's great. And that great. there are multiple services that people use in order to do this. Um, one of them that's very popular is a messaging thing is WeChat. Uh, people use Go SMS Pro for messaging. But the app that people use most often for calling that works across pretty much all cell phone networks is the one called Viber, V-I-B-E-R, V-Victory, I-B-Bob-E-R. Okay. And Viber is free for you, free for her, and the phone call quality, as long as the network is good, the call quality is great. And you call from the Viber app, and you can... Anybody on Viber, you just click on their contact, and the call goes right out like pretty much any other phone call. It just is not a call you have to pay for. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. And the chips will be cheap. You know, she will be able to buy. uh, She may need very little calling within Turkey being on the base. And what will be more interesting to her is buying a plan that's heavy on data, because these apps all use the data side of the phone rather than the traditional calling side on the phone. Yeah. Writing all this down. And I know that Turkey has been so much in the news with um, violence. It was just another terrorist attack there. And I want to give you some peace of mind that uh, people serving at that base have been uh, very safe. It's been very rare there's been any incident involving any of the military facilities in Turkey. 
Because I know as a parent, you got to have that in your mind. Oh, it was uh, that was our first uh, first instinct uh, is to to uh, you know educate ourselves as much as we can. Of course, that's all you see is the bad stuff. Yeah, I'll tell you to have some peace about that. I I will. I appreciate it so much, Clark. I thank you. All right, best to you and to her. John joins us on the Clark Howard Show. Hello, John. Hey, Clark. John, you got a question about your son. Yeah, we had our first son last year, and congratulations. My wife and I a, thank you. We started a five twenty nine plan for him, and got some questions because it doesn't seem that clear. But uh, what if he gets lucky and one day he gets a scholarship? And we've got all this money tied up in a, a five twenty nine plan. That is and, a great question. Yeah, and, I'm curious to know what happens to that money if he doesn't need it, or does, when he's part of it, who gets it? When, you know, when, when he's done with school, does he get to keep it, or do we have to pass it on to a, a sibling or another family member, or can he just use it? Right. Let me give you what happens as the law stands now. You know, the law 17 years from now could be different, but pretty much the way it plays is – if he gets a scholarship, and let's say very unusual that he would get a full free ride, mm-hmm. then if you take the money, the penalty that you would normally pay on a 529 plan, not using it for college, the penalty is waived, but tax on whatever earnings have been is still in place. But okay. even when a very bright Uh, son or daughter gets a heavy scholarship, usually it is not all-encompassing. And there will still be housing expenses. There will still be other eligible expenses like needing uh, stuff for school. Or maybe your son would end up wanting to go to graduate school, and the 529 plan can be used for that. So even if your son scholarshiped, Odds are that it won't cover all eligible expenses, and you still use the 529 for that. But yeah. let's say you don't need it for it gets full free ride, doesn't go to graduate school, and you got that money sitting there. So under the law, you can move it to the benefit of another child tax free and penalty free. You can name yourself as a beneficiary and decide to go back to school and have it tax and penalty free. And again, if it's a full scholarship deal, there's no penalty, just tax. Got it. Got it. Okay. Now, this may be a stupid question, but uh, this does not apply to anything pre-college. Say if he goes to a a camp, you know, a prep camp in the summertime or some kind of uh, prep school for high school. No, Uh, can't use it for anything like that. There is a different kind of account what are the odds that your son will go to private school at any point between now and age eight, uh, 17, let's say 18, for college? Somewhat likely. Okay, so if private school is likely, there's an obscure account very few people know about, even in the financial community, called a Coverdell ESA, Education Savings Account. And a Coverdell spelled C-O-V-E-R-D-E-L-L, Coverdell allows $2,000 a year to go into an account that can be used for private school or college. Hmm. And so the first $2,000, if there's a chance, a good chance a kid will go to private school, the first $2,000 saved each year should go into a Coverdell, and then if there's more money you want to save, then you put money in the 529. That's a great advice. Thank you. Sure. And I hope you're right that the this one year old this one year old's already showing signs of genius. <laughs> uh, he asked his mom and dad. You say yes. <laughs> well, good for you. Here on the Clark Howard Show, one key rule: I want to keep you out of harm's way. It's why we do the Clark Rageous moment. Scams, ripoffs, outrages. It's a Clark Rageous moment. I read a story on Deal Book about Morgan Stanley, one of the big full commission stock brokerages, and a rogue broker 
they have who is alleged to have stolen $50 million, $50 million from customers on his books at Morgan Stanley. And what is absolutely unbelievable is that people in the firm allegedly were well aware of the problems with the broker, and Morgan Stanley looked the other way, and now all these clients who had their money swiped are in a huge fight with Morgan Stanley to get their money back through these kangaroo court arbitrations. And it is just absolutely abysmal. In this whole story, I see no apology from Morgan Stanley about all the money that was stolen from its clients that were being handled by their broker. I want you to understand when you, and by the way, Morgan Stanley, you are free to have a representative come on the air and why, and explain why I am so wrong about why no one should do business with any stockbroker that does not carry a fiduciary duty to its customers. Because I think it's insane for anybody to put their hard-earned money with any firm that by the contract you sign, the firm is not taking on a responsibility. They're there to do what's best for you instead of what's best for the firm. You be aware, anytime you do business with a full commission broker, they are not there working for you first. You are almost an afterthought. And that is Clark Rages. You know, research has shown that sitting all day is bad for your health. But standing all day really isn't that much better for you. That's why it's so exciting to know that with Veradesk's height adjustable standing desk solutions, you can stand when you want to and sit when you need to. Veradesk converts your existing desk or cubicle to a sit-stand workstation, and it allows you to raise from a seated to standing position in just seconds. It ships fully assembled, so there's no Allen wrenches or screwdrivers required. You just pull it out of the box, and you put it right there on your desk. There's no installation or fastening required. By using a Veradesk sit-stand desk, you make health and fitness a part of your workday instead of just something that you do before or after work. You'll be more productive, you'll have less back pain, you'll have better energy, and it's likely to boost your metabolism. Plus, they've got different models you can choose from. So there's a Veradesk that will fit in your workspace, whether it's at home, the office, a corner office, a cubicle, a corner, even a full desk replacement. And they're all affordable. The models start at just $175. And here's the really cool part. If you're not sure the Veradesk is right for you, they have a 30-day risk-free guarantee, which lets you try it out in your home or office. And if you decide it's not for you, they'll arrange to pick it up. You don't have to do anything. To read the amazing reviews and find the model that's right for you, just go to veradesk.com. That's V-A-R-I desk.com. Veradesk. Welcome to the Clark Howard Show, where it's about you learning ways to keep more of what you make. Our web address, clark.com. When you have a question for me, clark.com slash ask. In this year's presidential sweepstakes, both major party political candidates have turned negative on trade. Donald Trump, extremely negative on trade. Hillary Clinton now talking, well, turning against the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is one of those pointy-headed things a lot of Americans aren't really sure of how it plays, but it's a trade agreement that will make trade easier with us and Asian countries as a buffer against the Chinese and their influence across Asia. Well, this agreement may go down crashing and burning, and I will tell you it is terrible for our nation strategically, but also economically. Trade has been looked at as such a bad thing this year. And I know this isn't the kind of thing that gets people's pulses racing or gets to the simple kind of solutions to fix what ails America. But what ails America is not trade with foreign nations. It actually makes America stronger because we are depending on who measures it, either the number one or number two beneficiary of trade in the world. We do enormous amounts of trade. 
around the world. People buy from us all over the world. Huge amounts of stuff. Employment in manufacturing in the United States is nothing like it used to be. Nothing. So how do you square those two things? This kind of stuff you're not going to hear Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump talk about because it's not easy kind of soundbite stuff. And it can lead to bad policy that will harm our country. Here's the truth. Those manufacturing jobs that have vanished have vanished overwhelmingly because of advanced technology and manufacturing, like robots, not because of the Chinese lobbying DVD players at us or whatever. The idea that this is all about people who aren't trading fairly with us is crazy. And it may make you feel good when the factory you worked in closed that somebody's saying, oh, we're going to erect barriers or tariffs or whatever, and we're going to bring jobs back in manufacturing to America, if only it was that simple. Throughout our history, going back to the creation of the Republic in the 1780s, we have always faced a changing demand for workers, what people are expected to do. As technology, which is a word we didn't use with agriculture, but, I mean, basically, with a modern definition, that's what it was, that changed the nature of work on the farm. Throughout history, the way we do things changes. The jobs that exist change. It is miserable for someone who earns their living from it when that changes. I work in a business where the employment has completely hollowed out in radio and TV. I was giving somebody a tour of the control room that puts on a a local television newscast just a week ago. And we were in a room that had 18 chairs, the control room. And I was explaining to the person who was with me that when the facility opened in 1997, it took all 18 of those chairs to be filled to put on that newscast. And I asked the guy sitting at the desk who was putting on the newscast, I said, and there were two people in there, I said, how many people now does it take to put on the newscast? I knew the answer. I was just asking the question for the person who was on the tour with me. He said, well, we use two, but you could do it with one. All the automation eliminated what had been 18 jobs and brought it down to two. It is part of what happens with the nature of work, and it's been that way for as far back as you can study. What we need is a new industrial policy in the United States that acknowledges and recognizes this. And it's not as easy as saying something that'll work on the evening news in 12 seconds about, well, because of those Chinese, we need to put up trade barriers and add tariffs of 50%, blah, blah, blah. How many seconds did that take? That took seven. Anyway, if you say we need to create a lifelong learning process where people... As jobs change, and the nature of those jobs change, that people get the education and training they need to continue to fill high-paying jobs that will provide a decent living to them and their families. Now, that's not going to work on the stump, but it's the truth. It is easy during an election cycle to demagogue any issue and to reach somebody on an emotional level. But I will pledge to you through this entire campaign 
that with different things that are part of the public conversation, I'm going to hit you with the true economics, as I see them, of the issues that are being emotionally addressed rather than ways that are fundamental that will improve the lives of our families and ourselves and improve the prospects for our nation. Kevin is with us on the Clark Howard Show. Hello, Kevin. Hi, Clark. Kevin, you're looking to buy your first house. Yes, sir. Congratulations. Thank you. My wife and I are newlyweds, and we're looking for our first house. Uh, it's in. Uh, we're looking in a hot part of our uh, town, and we found a nice home that we like, and it happens to be distressed. It was foreclosed to the lender. No one bid on it on the courthouse steps on the first Tuesday of this month. And I'm trying to find out exactly how to perhaps make an, an offer to the, the bank or the investor that actually owns the home maybe before it even gets on the market and they put money into it. Um, I, through the loan documents, found the loan servicing company that is servicing that, that note. And they, I reached out to them and got a response to that their investor actually, quote, unquote, manages their own REO and that they would pass along my inquiry. I guess my, my question is, is there a way for me to myself find out who actually owns legal title to the Piercing home? is going to be very, very difficult in that case. Okay. Because you live in a state that uses a process that is different than many states in the country called non-judicial foreclosure. Okay. That they did not have to file an action in court, and they did not have to disclose in a court filing who the actual owner of the property is. The company that acts as the mortgage servicer is acting only on behalf of whoever the actual owner of that property is, which would likely be uh, uh, some form of big investment company that would be a financial house that would own the underlying interest in that foreclosed property. So there is no particularly easy way I know of to find that out. Are you working with a licensed real estate agent? I am not. Because if there is somebody in the zip code you're looking at who specializes in distressed real estate, of which there's not as many people that are doing that today as much of the country has moved out of the distress phase. But if you can find somebody local in your area who specializes in that, they're very good at taking the the crumbs of information you've been able to find and tracking down potentially who would be that seller. The beauty, though, if you get through that process is that to that investor owner of that property, they are a reluctant owner. They don't want it. And every week that that property stays in their hands, there's a greater chance of vandalism to the house, theft of anything valuable in the house like copper or anything like that, and the value of the house deteriorates quite rapidly. So they would love to have somebody like you come along and say, I will take this problem off your hands. Got it. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hey, Kevin, if you're able to pull this off and it ends up the house you own, please let me know. I will do that. Right. Best to you. Nancy's with us on the Clark Howard Show. Hello, Nancy. Hi, Howard. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Your son is an entrepreneur. He is. He really is. Um he has a small company with about 30 employees, and he's built it from scratch, and very proud of him. That is very exciting. Mm-hmm. So he's built, from, from just his own idea and hard work, he's built a thriving business. Yes, he has, yes. Great. He has a partner, him and his partner has, so yeah, it's been, it's been, there's been hard times, but it's turned out really well, and they're doing very well now. That is so neat. How can I yeah. be of help with this success story? Well, I help him out somewhat. Um, I have uh, expertise in human resources, and he had a, an unscrupulous accounting clerk steal a, a major gas card that they had used for their company. Oh. Um, yeah. And she took it upon herself to take this gas only card to three different locations of this large gas company and purchase lottery tickets with them. What? The tune of what? $6, Wait, what? Yes. No yeah. way. Yes. The thief. 
goes in with an oil company card and uh-huh. is able at the convenience store part of a gas station uh-huh. to buy lottery tickets on the yes. company gas card? Yes, yes. To the amount of how much in lottery over, tickets? Uh, over $6,000. What? Yes. She has since been arrested, but... <laughs> And let me tell you something about the law. The the courts don't actually care about your son and his partner's losses. I'm serious. The law doesn't. That's not there. They are only concerned at protecting the public's interest, which is different than your son and his partner's interest. Mm-hmm. So what they're doing is about about prosecuting and sending her to prison for theft right and so it doesn't do anything about resolving your son and his partner's six thousand dollars no no so i the reason they didn't catch it was because we were lucky enough that we had an employee that worked um that we knew at worked at one of these stations actually brought it to our attention because we didn't know it was happening because when they would be invoiced the invoice from this large mega company would show up as gasoline instead of lottery tickets. We did get copies of about $2,000 of the receipts uh, from the station showing it was lottery tickets and matching it to the invoice, and the invoice comes up as super and gas. So you that- think somebody at the station was conspiring with the employee? No, no. I believe it was at the mega company. Um, That's just their record keeping is thin. Somebody at the mega gas company's accounting, because when they get it, they would back into it. Say, for instance, if there was a hundred dollars lottery ticket, the invoice would show twenty six point five gallons of gasoline at three dollars and seventy seven, you know, cents a gallon, and they would back into that one hundred dollars. Wow! So it was intentionally done. Um, so somebody was working in cahoots with the bad employee. You think? No, I think that. I've checked at the station. Whatever goes into that computer... Oh, oh so it's sent. an automated system. Yes. So are you wondering if the oil company is responsible for the... Yes. Not that I would be aware of. The yes. responsibility first, this is such a terrible thing to say, but in a business, the responsibility for an errant employee is looked at almost exclusively under the law, is being the burden on your son and his partner. Right. That's right. probably what you've heard elsewhere. Right. Well, he was lucky enough that he spends a considerable, ma- spend a considerable amount of gasoline to the tune of, in the last 10 years, almost $300,000 in gasoline with this on this car- these cards. And so the, the credit card company for the big mega gas company uh, did respond back and said, hey, you know, we don't want to lose your business, and we, we understand that, you know, this shouldn't have come up shown it because they would have caught it if it had said lottery tickets. Obviously, it was in a red flag. Right. But because the invoicing said gasoline, um, they didn't catch it as soon as they should have. So are they doing anything for your son? They did. The, the credit card company did give them half of the, the money back and said in good faith, I think. Then I would because, say for your son and his partner, you just... Take the lumps on the three thousand. There's no requirement that I know of that they would have been required to do that. It's a terrible story, but the good news is half recovery is tremendous, and that the person's being prosecuted even better. And you know, your son's been in business a good while. This is an unusual situation. I hope it doesn't change his impression of the rest of his employees that are hardworking and honest. It's time for Ask Clark. That's where you post a question for me at Clark.com. And then Joel, our producer, asks your question for you. Joel, who's this one from? All right, Clark, this one's from Marilyn. She wants to screen her tenants better and says, Clark, is there anything that I can use to do better screening of possible tenants? That is a great question that has gotten so much easier. First, Cozy.co, not .com, .co, C-O-Z-Y dot C-O. Check it out. And the other, MySmartMove.com, both give the ability for a small landlord to check out a prospective tenant. And your tenant, if you make it part of your application, has to pay the fee for the background check.
Brad writes in, what happens to a paid-for timeshare when the owner passes away without a will? First of all, I'm sorry about the loved one you have lost. It passes as, as supposedly an asset of the estate, although a timeshare is usually a liability. If you are the appointed executor of the estate, you can notify the timeshare company that the individual has passed away, and that's all you do is you give them that notice, don't ask anything else, and then they will have a period of time to make a claim against the estate that varies by state. If the whole goal is to avoid liability for any heir of that timeshare, the notification is necessary. The Again, the time period the timeshare operator would have to come back at the executor with a claim against the estate varies by a significant period of time from state to state. You know, there's something about TrueCar that a lot of people don't even know. Here it is. Using TrueCar can also help you buy a used car. That's right. In fact, there are over 500,000 pre-owned vehicles available from TrueCar's certified dealers nationwide. So whether you're looking to buy a brand new car or a used car, you can get all the upfront pricing information that empowers you. You can also get discounts off the list price for used cars and a totally better buying experience through the TrueCar certified dealer network. That's where you see what other people paid for the car that you want, so you know you're getting a fair price and you can feel confident. And with TrueCar, you connect with a local certified dealer of your choice, so you can enjoy a quick, easy buying experience. You can use the TrueCar website or the TrueCar app, so it's easy to find the new or used car that you want. You just take your guaranteed savings certificate to a TrueCar certified dealer, and you'll save money on that used car. And if you're buying new, the average true car user saves $3,279 off MSRP. Over 2 million people have already bought their cars through the True Car Certified Dealer Network. So if you're ready to buy a new or used car, visit TrueCar.com or take it with you by downloading the True Car app and enjoy a better car buying experience. Some features are not available in all states. <laughs> I'm so glad you're with us on the Clark Howard Show, where it's about you learning ways to save more and spend less and avoid getting ripped off. We serve you on the web at Clark.com when you have a question for me, Clark.com slash ask. I want to talk about entrepreneurs in just a half hour. Great, great, great news on the entrepreneurial front across the United States. So important because economic growth comes absolutely from the people who have the guts, the entrepreneurs, the inventors that improve our lives and create ultimately economic growth from what they come up with. And there are more of them, but that's a half hour from now. I'm going to talk about having more or less cash. This was one that has really taught me something. So there's a professor in the United Kingdom who was reported on in the Wall Street Journal of Europe who found that regardless of how wealthy you are or not, that if you never have cash on hand, it causes all kinds of problems for you. A lot of people who may, on paper, look like they got money. They may have investments or possessions or whatever, but they don't have any cash that it creates all kinds of underlying anxiety and actually can make you unhappy. Now, money doesn't make you happy once you hit a certain level, but the absence of money can cause all kinds of sleeplessness, worry, anxiety, whatever. And so this comes full circle to when I talk about how it's never what you make, it's what you don't spend that counts. Regardless of where you are on the income ladder, building up rainy day money is really important. And one of the odd findings of this professor was that when you have a lot of investments, let's say, let's say you're one of the people who's been really lucky to have investments in 
stocks or whatever, you got a nice 401k, maybe you own a rental property or two, but if you have no available cash, it creates insecurity. So I'm guilty of, over the years, talking about how important it is to be fully invested and that I'm not into having cash on hand at all. And it, maybe that works with my personality, but for most people, having cash for the unexpected creates a much more secure environment for you. You know, you hear all the advice about having a rainy day fund, and surveys show more than half of Americans cannot handle a single simple financial emergency of a couple hundred dollars or more. And then think about the insecurity and anxiety that causes. So here's my challenge to you. Regardless of what you make, take a little bit of money each pay period and put it aside into savings. If you're lucky enough to do your banking at a credit union, Credit unions are wired to help you do this. It's part of their culture to help you each pay period divert a certain amount of money into a savings account that you can use for rainy day. Be prepared because, you know, inevitably, pretty much at some point, it's always going to storm financially. Are you prepared? Lydia is with us on the Clark Howard Show. Hello, Lydia. Hello, how are you? Great, thank you, Lydia. You are someone who doesn't like being in debt. (laughs) No, I do not. (laughs) Well, join the club, because I hate debt, too. (laughs) Well, um, my husband and I, we we purchased our house back in 2003, and ever since then, we've been paying a minimum of about $300 additional principal per month. And, um, And so we're... We'd love to be able to pay our house off as soon as possible. But in, in that, or since that time, we've had several people tell us that, you know, we probably wouldn't want to pay it off necessarily because then we don't get the tax break or tax credit. But, I mean, to us, it just makes common sense that to not owe a mortgage, it would, it would pay off. Be yeah, the mortgage price. interest deduction is so oversold. The people who really benefit from the mortgage interest deduction, in fact, almost all the benefit under the tax code, goes to people who make more than roughly $400,000 a year. Okay, which we don't. Most people end up, uh, if they do go beyond the standard deduction, they don't go enough beyond it that there's a real bang for the buck in the mortgage interest deduction regardless. So let's talk about this. So you've been paying for, a, mm-hmm. you at this point owe how much money on your home? Um, about 89000 Okay. And do you know what interest rate you're paying? I believe it's four and a quarter. Okay. There's a move you might consider. Okay. And that is a lot of credit unions will do, uh, you could do a seven-year loan, you could do a 10-year loan. And they carry extremely low interest rates. Okay. And the cost of doing those refis is very cheap. I'm looking right now to see what kind of interest rate you'd be getting to see if it's worth doing. Let me look. I'm going to look at my own credit union (laughs) while we're talking and see what they're charging for loans. Oh, Joel beat me to it. Thank you, Joel. (laughs) I mean, he may be eating snacks while I'm talking to him, but he's getting me good information. So they're charging 2.875% on seven-year and 10-year loans. Okay. So if you're at four-point something, you might really benefit from, you've got, I assume, doing all these extra payments, you've got a lot of equity in your home. Yes, we do. So going into a loan in the twos, would give you the double benefit that you're getting a significantly lower interest rate and you're just paying that payment and bam in seven years or if you want to go 10 you're done well and 
I've heard, I've listened, or my husband and I, we've listened to you for a long time now, and I, I know that you've said before, you know, to kind of weigh it out how much the closing cost would be versus how much you'd actually save. Yeah, but, and generally 30 months or less. If you make back the closing costs in 30 months or less, it's worth doing. Okay. But if you sit down with a loan officer, are you a member of a credit union yet? I am. So you sit down with a loan officer at the credit union, he or she will be able to lay out a seven-year or 10-year loan option for you. Most will do those loans. Banks hate those short loans. They want you to stay in debt. Credit mm-hmm. unions, since they're owned by their members, are trying to do whatever's best for you. So you do a seven-year loan. Think about it. You're on that countdown clock. 84 months later, you're debt-free. Mm-hmm. So all the people that tell you how brilliant it is to stay in debt, see you have the mortgage interest deduction, smile and say thank you, and you keep <laughs> what doing what you're doing. So is this the only debt you have remaining is your mortgage? Um, no, we have probably a total of about 3000 in credit cards and maybe 14 on a on a vehicle that we purchased okay. last year. Car loans just take care of themselves over time. They usually have very low interest rates. I hope yours does. Mm -hmm. Does it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. And the credit card debt, I don't like you having that. I would like for you to get rid of that debt. That would be a higher priority than paying extra on a mortgage. But right now, please, go get into that credit union and see what you can do on that refi. And if it's too expensive to do it, Just keep paying like you're paying, paying extra all the time. Robert is with us on the Clark Howard Show. Robert, you are interested in buying a home. Yeah, me and my wife, we actually sat with a mortgage rep, and they went over our financial situation. And they said, uh, you know, just take out some more credit and meet back with us in 10 months. Take out more credit? Yeah, they just said our credit isn't bad. I just don't have enough because I'm, I've am i never been a fan of credit cards. Okay. So I, I want uh, you to become a bit of a fan of credit cards. Yeah, I, I actually just took out one small card. Okay. And um, he told me to take out one more line of credit and meet with him in 10 months. So and, here's a, here's and what a, kind of line of credit was the was the lender recommending? Um, he just said really anything. I just didn't have enough on my credit report. I just didn't have enough outstanding credit. It was mainly just small bills. And what are you thinking of doing to meet that standard that you've been recommended to do? Well, my wife has been trying to convince me to get a car loan through um, my job's credit union. So well, that's why I'm calling today. I would tell you that that would not be my suggestion. Because then you're creating an obligation that you, that just sits there for four, five, six years, you know, because how long people take out car loans. And that would hurt you with the mortgage loan underwriter in qualifying in terms of income and debt for buying a home. On the other hand, because think about that. You buy a car, average cost of a car today is $32,000. Okay. Let's say you buy a, were you thinking new or used? Oh, uh, used. So let's say you buy a used one, half that for sixteen grand. So you buy a $16,000 car. As you're looking at what that obligation is per month, the lender is looking at that for the mortgage as well, and they're not as excited about writing you a, as big a mortgage because they know you already have this much you have to pay per month. On the other hand... You get another credit card. The credit card helps you in your credit mix just by using it occasionally and paying it off and being right. current with payments. But at the same time, even though it helps you with your credit history and credit standing and credit score, it doesn't create the obligation the car loan does where that then becomes a potential problem to you qualifying for the mortgage based on how much you already owe and have to pay every month. Right, and that's kind of what I was thinking. So uh, I now my my answer is your wife is always right. But in this case, 
I'm not going to say that. Understood. Okay. So I would go to the credit union and get a small credit card from them. Is that who you got the one you have already? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, then after you've had that one for about 60 days, apply for a credit card somewhere else, maybe another credit union. Okay. And that would be my favorite way for you to get that credit history beefed up, show your use of credit that you're responsible with it, and move forward from there instead of you going and having a car loan that's like, oh, I love this car, but now we can't buy the home. Just keep paying like you're paying, paying extra all the time. Follow me at facebook.com slash Clark Howard. Our web address, clark.com. When you got a question for me, go clark.com slash ask. And Cleneal is with us on the Clark Howard Show. Hi, how are you doing? A little nervous right now. <laughs> oh, no. Let's see if I can be of help. Okay. Uh, someone posted my cell phone number on a not-so-legit, kind of sleazy website today. And I've been getting oh. about 10 calls, and one of the callers has, was nice enough to tell me where it came from. So um, the, the way you said that... was you. Sorry? The first person I thought of was you. So you're getting all these calls from somebody posting, is it like a classified ad or something? It is. And are they trying to sell something that is inappropriate kind of stuff? Yes, sir. Okay. Is it adult kind of entertainment? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh. All right. Is there anybody who might specifically be trying to have fun at your expense? Sounds like it, but I think it was just a uh, just a error in posting the okay. phone number. All right, the site where you're listed is not a sleazy site. Just the ad, correct, is one that is sleazy. Correct. Have you and contacted the website and said, "Hey, I emailed, but you know, sometimes they just kind of ignore that." I tried to find a phone number, couldn't find yeah, one. Yeah, you I won't mean, find one. It's countrywide. Yeah, it's countrywide. All right. So email them again and email them again. And I am so sorry because people are calling you with most inappropriate stuff. <laughs> well, at least one person has helped me out. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> he gave me the website. So Okay. And the people who, what's in it for them? Like what advantage is they're listing the wrong phone number in this ad? It's kind of dumb, isn't it? Well, either, that's why I was asking if anybody specifically may have had a grudge against you or thought it was some kind of cute thing to do to you um i don't know of anything you know a, a, a mature older woman don't usually have these problems so. got it got it <laughs> all right well the good news is that these ads pretty quickly move down the list good and aren't seen as much but i would keep emailing since there is no phone number i would keep emailing the classified ad site and say help 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 because that's crazy, and I, I'm really, really sorry that that's happening to you. Is anybody saying things to you that are really inappropriate? No, they've all been, l luckily, they've all been pretty nice callers. I tell them, they're asking, you know, wrong number, please call. Please, you know, wrong number, please don't call me again. Okay, well, I hope that that ad gets pulled down soon or that whoever put it up with the wrong number will realize, oh, we're not getting any money from this, and correct it with a new listing. Let me know what happens. Stay tuned for 60 seconds of AP News headlines right after this podcast. I'm glad you're with us on the Clark Howard Show, where it's about you learning ways to save more and spend less and don't let anyone ever rip you off. You can follow me at facebook.com slash Clark Howard. When you have a question, clark.com slash ask, and our web address, of course, clark.com. You know, this country grows economically not because of what government does or doesn't do. It grows because of what you and I do with this can-do entrepreneurial spirit that is so much a part of American culture 
And there are people who say that's myth. Let me tell you, it's not myth. I've traveled all over the globe, every continent except Antarctica. I wouldn't learn a lot about entrepreneurial spirit in Antarctica from all the wildlife, the icebergs. So I've traveled everywhere, and I've seen what the mentality is in countries everywhere. And we have something that's so special here. And it's why we remain a beacon of hope and opportunity for the world. It's funny because we as Americans have less faith in ourselves when we think of our country than people outside the country looking at us. We're doubting ourselves these days, and we shouldn't because startup activity is booming right now in the United States. It's just great because people for whatever reason, many reasons actually, have the guts to get out there and start something. And one of the things that's helped is is banks have failed in lending money to entrepreneurs and small businesses. New independent organizations have come in and been doing a lot of the lending to small businesses. I've talked about that, and we've got information for you on that for small business lending at Clark.com. And so people are getting out there and they're trying things. You know, an entrepreneur has to be willing to move out of his or her comfort zone, safe zone, and be willing to take a chance and be willing to fail. But the number of new businesses starting on average each month in the country, according to new data that was done by a foundation called the Kauffman Foundation, shows that 550,000 new businesses were started on average each and every month over the last year. That's huge. Think about that. That's 6.6 million new businesses. And no, they're not all going to succeed. But what I want you to know is that if you're sitting there thinking in your daily life, in your leisure time or your work time, there ought to be, there could have, should have been, this, that, or the other, service or product or idea that's something that would make somebody's life better or more enjoyable or you can do something better or cheaper than somebody else, go for it. Go for it. Because not only do you create the opportunity for you to be successful, but if you really do hit it right with the idea of the product or service that benefits others, then you are creating a public benefit. You got that idea? Do the gut check and go for it. Frank is with us. Hello, Frank. Hi, Clark. Got a question for you. We just received letters from the university that a computer that had student information on it from over 20 years ago was accessed or corrupted or whatever, and all of that information that you as a college student have to give your university is now floating out there. And so I know to put... You know what they would usually have, Frank. They would have date of birth. They would have information on your parents. And so that's key for criminals, knowing your mother's maiden name. They would likely have that social security number. I mean, that is a treasure of information for uh, criminals in the wrong hands. They can cause a lot of havoc seizing identities. Yes. What has the university urged you and the others to do? They really haven't urged anything. They've just notified that this is what's going on. Okay. And so, like I said, other than putting the fraud alerts on. Fraud alerts are a joke. Okay. Those are, uh, that's window dressing. If you want to protect yourself as solidly as you possibly can, there's a process that uh, that is now a national process, but with differences in how it works state to state, known as credit freeze. Okay. And here's the difference between a fraud alert and a credit freeze. A fraud alert is kind of like a flag on your credit report that may or may not be noticed by someone when someone applies for credit. A credit freeze makes it impossible for a criminal to open up credit as if they're you. That's a pretty big difference. Yes. How a credit freeze works is with each of the credit bureaus, you put in place a freeze, 
and each bureau assigns you a secret code. And so you have three different secret codes. Make sure you don't lose them, because that gets to be a problem if you lose them. Let's say a criminal, having tapped this university database, goes and tries to open an account. Well, when they run credit on that criminal, who may even have a fake driver's license pretending to be you and all that, they're rejected immediately because the credit cannot be accessed. Boom, they're shut down, and they don't have your secret code. On the other hand, let's say you are going to apply for credit somewhere, or you want to start service with a satellite company or phone company or cell phone company or whatever. You ask them, what credit bureau do you pull from is kind of the term they use. And they'll tell you Equifax or TransUnion or Experian. Whoever it is they pull from, you then temporarily thaw that credit file only. And you'll go to the website of the credit bureau. You punch in your your secret code and uh, your other information they'll ask for. And then listen to this. In 15 seconds, your credit is thawed. So what's it going to cost? Would you like to know that? Yes, I would. Okay. It is $5,000 per bureau. Just kidding. (laughs) It is anywhere from $0 to $10. Okay. And the difference between the zero and ten, ten is the absolute most you can pay. Zero is, uh, like in many states, senior citizens qualify for zero. In most states, if you have been a victim of identity theft, you qualify for zero. It gets really fuzzy, though, in a number of states whether the breach that happened with your data being out there would qualify you for free or not. Okay. So... Um, I have a credit freeze kit on my website. Okay. Do you still live in the state of Washington? Yes. Oh, then you can just go to my credit freeze kit, click on the Washington State link, and then you'll be able to see exactly what would be involved and what you would have to pay to freeze your credit. Let's say it's the worst possible scenario, and you pay 30 bucks for essentially a virtually ironclad insurance policy. Yeah. It's pretty good. It, it is. Well, I guess that whatever you give as donations to your alma mater each year, you're going to do minus $30 this time to cover your cost of the credit freeze. I'm disappointed also that your university has not offered anything to you as a way for you to protect yourself. And do I say your name, Copen? Is that right? Yes, it's Copen. Hi, Copen. Hi, how Welcome are you? to the Clark Howard Show. Are you the only Copen you've ever met? Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> Isn't that neat, having a unique name? Yeah, it is. You won't find me on a coffee mug. <laughs> so you may not know this name, but I was actually named by my parents after Clark Gable. Oh, wow. A lot of people uh, have no idea who Clark Gable was at this point. You know who that was? No. No. <laughs> See, I knew. Isn't that an actor? Isn't that an actor? Yeah, yeah. He yeah. was, he was uh, in Gone with the Wind and lots yeah, of other things. Yeah, yeah. So, I knew I knew him. I knew I knew the name. That's funny. You can't so, hold that against me. <laughs> so how can I be of service to you? Yeah. Well, my son and his team won a science project. Um, First they won, uh, it was supposed to be a 1,000, but they won regionally, so now they've got 1,500. And he, they, they dispersed them in savings bonds. So I was wondering, do I need to just leave it and, and let it grow there, or is there some other place I could put it that it would, it would accrue more, uh, grow faster? Okay, so a savings bond... They don't. They just kind of sit there. They don't grow yeah. a whole lot. There was a time that I strongly recommended them. Actually, for a couple of decades, I strongly recommended them. And then the earning formula on the alphabet soup of the of the savings bonds was changed to make them less generous. Uh-huh. And so uh, your son's not going to earn much at all in that. Okay. What is the purpose of this found money? What do you think his purpose will be for the 1500 Well, I'm going to try and I'd like to put it somewhere so I, it, it would get the maximum growth, and I'm, I would like him to use it for college. Right now he's a, a whopping 12 years old. 
Okay, so 12. All right, so as a parent, you are allowed to take this money and use it for the benefit of your son. So I'm going to have you rob this money from your son so you can pay it back for your son's benefit. Okay. Let me tell you what I'd like you to do. you got to wait, I think it's uh, one year before you can cash these in. Uh-huh. And you'll forfeit some of the puny interest they'd earn. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And then anything that uh, for your son that he would do, like any after-school activities, if you have any tuition, clothes uh-huh. for him, you can spend this $1,500 for his benefit. Then I'd like you to take $1,500 of your own money uh-huh. that you would have spent otherwise and put it into a 529 college savings plan that you will own with him being the beneficiary. Oh, okay. Here's why. If he owns a 529 plan account, mm-hmm. which you could do once you'd cash in the money from the from the savings bonds, the problem is it affects his eligibility for financial aid for college. Oh, I see. Okay. If you own the account with him as the beneficiary, it has minimal effect on his eligibility for financial aid for college. Ah, I see. Okay. So that was a roundabout way of saying, I want you to use the fifteen hundred, and you know, for current needs for your son. So you replace the fifteen hundred with your own money that goes into a five twenty nine account that you own. Great, great. Makes sense. That makes perfect sense. And you know, I have a five twenty nine plan guide at ClarkHoward.com that'll walk you through what are the best plans and what the money should be in for your 12-year-old. And congratulations to him on winning the contest. Paul is with us on the Clark Howard Show. Hi, Paul. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. My pleasure, Paul. I am ecstatic to talk to you. Do you know why? Um, because I'm trying to save more money in, uh, in college right now. Yes. And so I don't know if you fell on your head as a young kid or you had a great influence in your life because it's not normal as a college student to already have a focus on how you're going to save. So who was it? Was it a parent? Was it a family member? How is it you got this inspiration to be a saver while you're still in school? Well, family members had, like, listened to your show and uh things like it growing up. So I've, I've heard your show growing up and recently decided to start listening to it again. And So you mean I successfully to... brainwashed you from a very young age to be a saver? Uh, I guess that might be true. Great. Okay. So tell me more about your situation and circumstances. Let's see how we get this started. Um, well, I'm 21. I turned 21 in January, and I'll be a senior in college in the fall. And I'm, I have a part-time job for the summer, and I'm hoping to just start saving up more and before I graduate to get a credit card and hopefully eventually open up a Roth IRA or something like that. So are you likely to go to grad school? Um, possibly. I'm going to be uh, likely entering the National Guard because I'm in RTC. Well, thank uh, you for your future service to our country. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so I, I'll likely be going to the National Guard, so I might do a grad program during that time, but I'm not sure. Right. Well, you have so many options available to you. And yes, when you are in a position to afford it, doing a Roth IRA at 21, 22, 23, nothing beats it. There's a dollar saved in your early 20s doubles so many times by the time you would use that money in retirement. The impact is magnified many times over. Okay. So and mm-hmm. the part-time work you're doing, do you need all that money for current living expenses, or are you throwing off excess cash right now? Well, I'm saving it up to try to be ready for rent in the fall, but um, some of it I'll be able to save at the end of the summer as well. How much would you guess? 
Um, if I had to guess, hopefully at least around, at least 500. Okay. So for now, as far as what you do, being in school, working part-time, just save that money. And when you hit a point that you've been able from part-time work to hit $1,000, that's when I want you to open your Roth IRA. And once you have it open, you'll be able to add to it at will in amounts up to $5,500 a year. Mm -hmm. And you keep doing that. And I'm telling you, you do that in your early to mid-20s, you will create financial security for you that will shock you later in life. Because you can figure you put money in at 21, roughly every 10 years, the money you have in will double again. So a dollar at 21 becomes two at 31, becomes four at 41, becomes eight at 51, and becomes 16 at 61. And that's with pretty conservative return on your money. So think about a dollar today becomes $16 pre-retirement. Way outstripping what inflation would be. So that's why you excited me so much with the idea of saving money. Yes, sir. So for right now, you just you just put that money aside, and when you cross that $1,000 threshold, you're ready to go. You open that Roth, and then you just keep pounding money into it over the years, and financial security becomes your future. Thanks for listening to the Clark Howard Podcast. Download new episodes every Monday through Friday at podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. Stay tuned for the latest AP News headlines from Podcast One right after this. When shopping for car insurance, consider this. GEICO has been saving people money on car insurance for over 75 years. So if you're serious about savings, it's simple. Go to GEICO.com. After 75 years, they know how to save you money. AP Update. I'm Rita Foley. Donald Trump is tweeting that he won the second presidential candidate's debate by a landslide. But he says it's hard for him to do well when the top Republican in Congress, Paul Ryan, and others whom he doesn't identify, give him no support. Ryan says he won't campaign for Trump following the release of a video on which Trump has heard using predatory language about women. Former Republican presidential candidate John McCain says he's withdrawing his support. When Mr. Trump attacks women and demeans the women in our nation and in our society, that is a point where... I had just have to part company. And after a weekend out of the public eye, Trump's running mate, Mike Pence, has resurfaced. It takes a big man to know when he's wrong and to admit it and to have the humility to apologize and be transparent and be vulnerable with people. Mike Pence at a Trump rally in North Carolina. I'm Rita Foley.